Hello, fifth grade. Today we will be reading chapters 10 through 13 of Where the Mountain Meets the Moon. Uh, when we left off, Minley had followed what she thought was a river, um, and there was a voice like crying out for help. And when she got there, she discovered a dragon. And then Ma and Ba were searching for Minley, and they thought they had found her tracks. And I also thought they had found her because they heard like a rustling up ahead. But when they got into the clearing, they, they um, actually found the goldfish man. So chapter 10, page 47. Minley gaped at the dragon in front of her. He was brilliant red, the color of a lucky lantern, with emerald green whiskers, horns, and a dull stone-colored ball like the moon on his head. At least what Minley could see of him looked like that, because he was also half covered by ropes of twine that had been tied tightly around him so he couldn't move, and by the silvery lake of water his tears had formed all around him. Minley had always thought it would be thrilling but scary to meet a dragon. Her father's stories always made them sound so wise and powerful and grand, but here was a dragon before her, tied up and crying. Minley didn't feel awed by it at all. In fact, she felt rather sorry for it. Can you help me? The dragon sniffled. I'm trapped. Millie shook herself and started swimming toward the dragon. What happened to you? She asked. The monkeys tied me up while I was sleeping, the dragon said. I've been here for days. Millie swam over to the dragon and climbed onto his back to get out of the water. There she opened her pack, took out the small sharp knife she had brought with her, and started cutting the twine. Why did the monkeys tie you up? Millie asked. Because I want to go farther into the forest to the peach grove, the dragon said. And the monkeys will not let anyone through. I've been trying to make them let me pass peacefully for days, but they are so unreasonable. Finally, I told them if they did not let me through, I would just force my way. They know I am big and strong enough to go through without their permission. So when I went to sleep, they tied me up. Why won't the monkeys let anyone pass, Minley asked. Because they are greedy things, the dragon said. They have just discovered the peach trees that make up the next part of the forest. The monkeys do not want to let anyone through because they do not want to share the peaches. Even when I promised not to touch any of the fruit, they would not let me through. They do not even want to share the sight of those peaches. Why do you have to go through the forest, Millie asked. Can't you just fly over? More tears, the size of thy chi nuts, rolled down the dragon's face. I cannot fly, he sobbed. I do not know why. All the dragons can fly, but I cannot. I wish I knew why. Don't cry, Minley said, patting the dragon, feeling more sorry for it than ever. I am going to Never Ending Mountain to see the old man of the moon and ask him how to change my, change my family's fortune. You can come too and ask him how to fly. You know where Never Ending Mountain is? the dragon asked. I thought to see the old man of the moon was impossible. You must be very wise to know how to find him. Not really, Minley said. I got the directions from a goldfish. Chapter 11 It took a long time for Minley to cut all the twine that bound the dragon. For some knots, she had to swim underwater and cut through the waving grasses. As she popped in and out of the water, cutting, she told the dragon all about her village, the goldfish, and how she had just started her journey. I'm Minley, she said to the dragon. What's your name? Name, the dragon asked slowly. I do not think I have a name. Everyone has a name, Minley said. When you were born, didn't someone give you a name? When I was born, the dragon asked, thinking hard. Yes, Millie said, again thinking that this dragon was very different from any dragon she had ever heard about. What did they call you when you were born? The Story of the Dragon When I was born, I remember two voices speaking. Master, one voice said, this is magnificent. The dragon is almost alive. Add more water to the inkstone, another voice said. This voice was near my head. I felt the warm air of his breath. And speak quietly, you will wake the dragon. I'm sorry, master, the first voice said in a more subdued tone. It is only that this painting is most amazing, even for such a skilled artist as you. This dragon painting will bring great honor to the village when we present it to the magistrate. Wasted on the magistrate, the master said under his breath, so softly that only I could hear. A conceited, self-important man who, 
when only the imperial family is allowed to use the image of a dragon, commissions one. Now that his son has married the king's daughter, Magistrate Tiger will do anything to flaunt his power and overstretch his authority. But this painting will buy his favor and free the village from his unfair taxes. What, master? the apprentice said. Nothing, the master said, only that I have painted this dragon on the ground, not flying in the sky like all other dragons. Perhaps the magistrate will see how his wealth weighs him down. I doubt the magistrate will understand that meaning, master, the apprentice said. True, the master said, but the dragon should still please him. I will prepare for his visit. The painting is finished. Clean the brushes and take great care with my special inkstone. It is one of a kind, the only inkstone that was able to be made from a rock my master cut from a mountain far from here. He never told anyone which mountain, so we can never make another. Yes, master, the apprentice said, but the dragon. Yes, the master said. Is it finished? The apprentice asked. You have not painted the eyes. As a painting, it is finished, the master said. Young apprentice, I still have much to teach you. And I heard the voices and footsteps fade away. It was a strange feeling. I felt the warm light of the sun running over my skin, but my arms and legs were frozen. I could hear the wind rustling leaves in the trees and birds hopping on the ground, but I saw nothing. Time passed. I only knew because the air grew colder. I heard footsteps coming toward me, many of them, so I knew it was a whole procession of people. As you requested, your magnificence, a voice said. I recognized it as the master's. May I present this, which I humbly painted in tribute to the great magistrate's rule. There was a silence as all gazed, I supposed, at me. Painter Chen, another voice said in great awe. This is indeed a great work. Thank you, Magistrate, the master said. I'm glad it pleases you. Then our, our agreement will be fulfilled? Yes, the voice said the voice. The village will be free from taxation for the next year, and I will take the painting. Even though I did not know exactly what was going on, I knew I did not want to belong to Magistrate Tiger. His voice had an undertone of cruelty and greed, even while he was expressing his pleasure. I tried to protest, but my still lips uttered no sound. Then I was rolled up and all sound and feeling disappeared. I do not know how long I was rolled up. It may have been a, a day or a month or a year. All I could do was wait. But finally I was unrolled and I felt a cold gust of air all over me. If I could have, I would have shivered. This painting is a masterpiece, a voice said in surprise. Then it quickly turned oily and flattering. As only fitting for your greatness. Yes, Magistrate Tiger said, have it hung behind my chair. Yes, Magistrate, the voice said, and then hesitated and said, How strange. What's strange? the Magistrate asked. Well, the voice said, there are no eyes on this dragon. The painter must have forgotten. No eyes? the Magistrate boomed. Master Chen dared give me an unfinished painting? I will double his ta double tax his village for the next ten years. Magistrate, a third voice said, one that seemed a little kinder. It is only a minor flaw. If we just dotted in the eyes, the dragon would be finished. Hmm. Yes, the magistrate said, obviously considering. Bring me a paintbrush and ink. I heard the servant shuffling and bringing the paintbrush and ink. I felt the magistrate's hot, dry breath on my nose as he came close to me and felt the cold ink touch my eye. And suddenly, I could see. I saw the magistrate's fat face leering over me as he reached over and dotted in my other eye. So fifth grade on page 56, you can see the magistrate leaning over the painting of dragon and dotting in the eyes. As sight came into both my eyes, a warm feeling filled me, like drinking hot tea on a cold day. I felt strength come into my arms and hands and legs and feet, and my neck and head stretched for the first time. All the yell loud yells I had wanted to make now came rushing out of my mouth, and I gave a huge roar that made the magistrate fall over. It has come alive, I heard him gasp, and I heard the servant screaming, Dragon! It has come alive, dragon! I knew this was my chance to free myself from Magistrate Tiger. I jumped from where I was and rushed over everyone, knocking down desks and chairs and columns. I saw the blue sky and green leaves through a window, went toward it, and simply crashed through the wall to get through. As I left, the building was falling down and all the people were yelling, Dragon! They screamed, Dragon! 
I knew I had to leave as soon as possible, so I ran as fast as I could into the forest and left them far, far away. I have lived in the forest since then. So I think, the dragon said, my name is Dragon, because that is what everyone called me. Dragon, Minley repeated, and she tried not to smile. Well, I guess it's a good enough name. It will be easy for me to remember. The dragon nodded, pleased to have found himself a name. So you were born from a painting, Minley said? That explains why you are so different from the dragons my father told me about. Your father knew other dragons? The dragon asked eagerly. I've never seen another dragon. I always thought if I could fly, I would finally see another like me. Um, well, Minley said, I don't think my father ever knew any dragons. He just told stories about them. Most people think dragons are just in stories. You are the only dragon I've ever met. Oh, the dragon said sadly, and I am not even a real dragon. All this time, Minley had been cutting the twine ropes. At that very moment, Minley cut the last rope and rubbed the dragon's arm. You're the only dragon I've ever met in real life, she said, and you feel real to me, so I think you're a real dragon, or at least real enough. Anyway, if we're going to never any mountain together, let's at least be real friends. Yes, dragon agreed, and they both smiled. Fifth grade, what do you think about a dragon being born from a painting? Do you think maybe it has something to do with that ink stone that the master painter was talking about. He said that his master, so that means the person who trained him, had created the ink stone from a special mountain, but he never told anyone which mountain so it couldn't be recreated. Do you think that maybe has some sort of magical powers that makes whatever is drawn come alive when it's completed? Perhaps. Let's keep reading. Chapter 12. The goldfish man turned around and smiled questioningly at Ma and Ba, who could do nothing but continue to stare. He was slender and small, which was perhaps why it was easy to mistake his footprints for Minley's. The dragging lines Ma had thought were Minley's walking stick led to his cart, and the bowls of goldfish caught the sifting beams from the sun, slivering it into flashing sparkles of light. The goldfish man's eyes also flashed as he looked at Ma and Ba in their dust-covered clothes and haggard, tired faces. Can I help you? He asked them. We were looking for our daughter, Ba stammered. We were from the village of Fruitless Mountain. You sold her a goldfish, and then, Ma sputtered, and then she ran away to change our fortune. I see, the goldfish man said, and again he looked at them, at Ma's tight, angry frown and Ba's careworn, worried face. And you are going after her to stop her? Of course, Ba said. We need to bring her home. Yes, Ma said. She is acting crazy. Who knows what could happen to her? She could succeed, the goldfish man said steadily. She could find a way to change your fortune. She's trying to find a never-ending mountain, Ma said. As questions the old man of the moon. There is no way for her to succeed. Yes, Ba said. It's impossible. The goldfish man looked a third time at, ba at Ma and Ba, and this time they felt it. Under his gaze, Ma and Ba suddenly felt like freshly peeled oranges, and their words fell away from them. Inexplic inexplicably, they felt ashamed. Now, fifth grade, here's a little bit more figurative language. It said, Ma and Ba suddenly felt like freshly peeled oranges. Now, do, do they actually feel like oranges? Not really, but the fact that it says freshly peeled oranges. What do you peel off of an orange? Well, it's outer peel, right? And then that reveals the soft, you know, juicy part of the orange that you eat. So for it to say Ma and Ba suddenly felt like freshly peeled oranges, do you think it probably means that the goldfish man's gaze kind of went beyond, you know, just their outward appearance and kind of like saw more than just what they looked like? Have you ever felt maybe that kind of a gaze from your mom or your dad. Maybe you say, I'm fine, but you can tell by their gaze that they are seeing past you trying to seem like you're fine to maybe an emotion you're trying to hide. That's exactly what it means. It's kind of like peeling off the outer layer that you are showing to the world and seeing what's actually underneath. Let me tell you a story, the goldfish man said. The story of the goldfish man. So we're going to learn a little bit more about the goldfish man. 
My grandmother, Lao Lao, was a famous fortune teller. People from faraway villages would line up at our home asking for lucky dates for weddings and predictions for their children. If she was ever wrong, we never heard of it. But a week before my 19th birthday, we heard her moaning in her room. When we rushed to her, we found her sitting on the floor with her fortune-telling stick spread around her. To my surprise, as soon as I entered the room, her piercing eyes fixed upon me. You, she said, you will die next week on your birthday. It was as if she had exploded a firecracker in the room. My parents and aunts and cousins burst into exclamations and wails. It is true, it is true, my grandmother insisted. I have checked and rechecked over and over again, and the sticks always say the same. Next week on his 19th birthday, he will die. That is his fortune. I could not believe it. How could this be? But my belief in my grandmother was unshakable. If she said so, it must be true. I stood staring as my family created a storm around me. Finally, I said with a mouth as dry as sand, Lao Lao, isn't there anything I can do? There's only one thing you can do, she said, but it is doubtful it will work. I'll do it, I said. First, Lao Lao said, we must get a bottle of the finest wine and make a box of sweets. So Lao Lao went to the rich magistrate of the town and persuaded him to give her a bottle of his best wine. My mother and aunts hurried to the kitchen and prepared cakes, cookies, and sweet meats with more care than ever before. Before the aromas of the delicacies were captured in our most ornate box, they floated in the air, causing all the neighborhood animals to whine at our door. And then Lao Lao went to her room and began to read her fortune sticks. When she came out, she gave me the box of sweets and bottle of wine and sat me down. Listen to me carefully, she said. You must do exactly as I say. Tomorrow morning, you must walk north of the village. Do not stop until the moon begins to appear in the sky. When it does, you will see a mountain before you. And at the foot of the mountain, you will see an old man reading a book. Open the box of sweets and bottle of wine and set them by him, but do not say a word unless he speaks to you first. This is the only chance we have to change your fortune. So the next morning I followed her instructions as it was as she had said. And it was as she'd said. I walked all day, and when the sun finally withdrew from the sky, there was a vast mountain in front of me whose tip seemed to touch the moon. Sitting cross-legged at the bottom was an old man reading a giant book. The light from the moon seemed to make him glow silver. I opened the bottle of wine and box of sweets and quietly laid them next to them, next to him. Then I sat and waited. The old man didn't notice me and continued to read. My mouth watered as the smell of the sweets drifted in the air, but I didn't move. And even though the old man was engrossed in his book, he must have smelled them as well, because without lifting his eyes from the page, he began to eat. It was only when the bottle of wine was empty and he was eating the last cake that the old man lifted his head. He seemed surprised to see a half-eaten cake in his hand. I've been eating someone's food, he said to himself. He looked up and saw me sitting nearby. You, boy, was this your food? Yes, I said, and I came closer as he beckoned. Well, he said to me, what are you doing here? I told the old man, of the, the old man my story while he rubbed his beard. When I finished, he said nothing but began to turn the pages in his book. Finally, he nodded. Yes, it's true, the old man said. You are to live only 19 years. And he turned the book toward me, and in, my, in the moonlight, moonlight, I read my name on the page. Next to my name was the number 19. Please, I couldn't help asking, isn't there any way to change it? Change it, the old man asked, surprised at the thought. Change the book of fortune? Yes, I nodded. Well, the old man said, stroking his beard, I am indebted to you for having eaten your food. He took a paintbrush from his robe and studied the page. Hmm, he said to himself, maybe if... No. Perhaps. Ah, yes, this is how it can be done. And with a simple flick from his brush, he changed the 19 to 99. Good, he said to me. You now have many more years of life. Live them well. Then he closed his book, stood up, and began to walk up the mountain, leaving me staring behind him. I sat there until he disappeared from sight and then turned around and went home. The next week, on my birthday, there was a terrible typhoon. The wind howled as it never had before, and a tree fell right on top of the roof of our house and crashed into my room, narrowly missing me. If it had fallen just a bit more to one side, I would have been easily killed. But as I climbed out of the ruins of my room, I saw my grandmother's eyes staring into mine. Silently, she nodded. 
She did not need words to tell me what had happened. I knew my fortune had been changed. But for Millie to try to do that is different, Boss started. She's trying to find Neverending Mountain. Ask a question. She's just a small girl. Perhaps, the goldfish man said, you need to trust her. But, Ma said, but what she wants is impossible. Impossible, the gold man, goldfish man said. Don't you see? Even fates written in the book of fortune can be changed. How can anything be impossible? Mom Ba could find no words. His eyes and the hundreds of eyes of the goldfish behind him seemed to silently scold them. As they looked at the ground, the goldfish man shifted back his bag and turned toward his cart. Here, a gift, the goldfish man said, placing a bowl into Ba's shaking hands. The fish, the pale silver color of the moon, circled in the bowl. Perhaps if you cannot trust that your daughter will find Neverending Mountain, you should trust that she will return home to you, because that is not impossible. So, whether Minley brings it to you or not, I wish you good fortune. And with a bow, the goldfish man walked away. His bowls of goldfish cast pieces of rainbows in the air, making him sparkle in the sun. Ma and Ba stood and watched him until he looked like a twinkling star in the distance. Chapter 13 after cutting the dragon free, Minley's knife was dull and the, and the skin on her fingers and toes was wrinkled from having been in the dragon's lake of tears for so long. She was also very thirsty. The dragon offered to carry her to the fresh water stream. He knew the forest well. You'll get there much faster, he said. Minley was a little doubtful about riding the dragon. It was one thing to climb on top of him while he was half covered by water, but now on dry land, she realized how large he really was. The dragon was long, as long as the street in front of Minley's house. If he stretched himself up on his arms and legs, he was as tall as a bird's nest in a tree, she realized. Even now, bending down for her, he was higher than her house. But he bent his elbow for her like a step, and with two hands she boosted herself up and then climbed onto his back. The round ball on the dragon's head was the size of a small melon, just big enough for her to wrap two hands around, and she clutched it as the dragon began to move. It was faster, but not much. The dragon was nimble, but his large body had to constantly maneuver around trees and rocks, so it was awkward going. The constant jerking made Minley feel like she was riding a huge water buffalo. As the dragon ducked underneath branches and swerved through trees, Minley understood why most dragons flew. Dragon? Minley asked suddenly. How old are you? Old, the dragon said, and again it seemed a question he had never been asked. I do not know. Well, Minley said, how long have you been in this forest? The dragon thought hard. A long time, he told her. I remember when a bird flew from the sky and dropped a peach pit onto the ground. I watched that pit grow into a tree, and the peaches fell from the tree, and more trees grew from the pits of those peaches until it became the grove of peach trees that the monkeys have now taken over. He is very old, Minley thought to herself, imagining the growth of the trees. Dragon must have been in his, this forest for a hundred years. And she felt a pang of pity as she imagined the dragon alone, unable to fly, endlessly struggling between trees and branches. After picking up her things and drinking at the freshwater stream, Minley climbed back onto the dragon's back. She soon fell asleep, her head on the dragon's ball, and her hand holding her rice bowl. Noticing she was asleep, the dragon moved slowly and quietly, even when the water from Minley's compass splashed and trickled down his nose. It was only when a loud shrieking filled the forest that Minley woke. It was such a wild and harsh noise that she bolted up, her eyes wide open in fear. Do not worry, the dragon told her. It is just the monkeys. And it was the monkeys. Even though the sun was dimming, Minley could still see the monkeys clamoring in the trees. Even though Minley could not count that many of them, their screaming made it sound as if there were thousands. We are getting close to the peach trees, the dragon told Minley, and they are getting angry. Stop here, Minley said. She climbed off the dragon's back, and she could still see the monkeys through the leaves and branches, their bared teeth flashing. Those peach trees are exactly the direction we want to go, Minley said. We have to get past the monkeys. I could still force my way through, but the monkeys would attack you, dragon said. I'm not sure if we could get through get you through unharmed. Listen to them. And the monkeys continued to scream. Manly covered her ears with her hands, but she could still hear them. It seemed like they were screeching, get away from here, hours, hours, all hours. You're right, Millie told the dragon. 
They are not going to let us through. But you said that is the way to the old man of the moon, said the dragon. Correct? Millie nodded. The monkey's shrieks were starting to sound like hysterical laughter, getting louder and louder like a volcano about to erupt. She looked from side to side, but the monkeys seemed to be everywhere. There was no way around them. Then, the dragon asked, what are we going to do? And that's where we're going to stop today, fifth grade. So, I want you to think about that. What do you think Minley and Dragon are going to do in order to try to get past the monkeys who are so protective of the peach trees that they just won't let anyone through? What do you think they're going to do about that? And what do you think Ma and Ba are going to do? After hearing the goldfish man's story and the goldfish man giving Ba that silver goldfish, what do you, or silver fish, I should say, what do you think Ma and Ba are going to do? Are they going to continue going after Minley? Or do you think they're going to turn back and go home? Nice job today, fifth grade.